bilingualism, giving you also a historical perspective of what was supposed to be good or bad about second language learning. And then I'll focus in the second part of the talk on my current research. And I'll uh, give you, you know, a flavor. <laughs> all right. I wanted to ask you, first of all, how many bilinguals there are in this room? <laughs> I now understand why you have so many eh, all interested in this topic. How many of you learn a, a second language since birth? And how many of you later in life, let's say, when you were adolescent? Okay. And how many monolinguals? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Minority. But I love minorities. Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay, so I'm not surprised by this large number of bilinguals being native bilinguals or late bilinguals. We'll see later what this means. Um, because bilingualism is really common. Hi, Grosjean. Who's French here? What does it mean, Grosjean, in English? Uh, Big John. Big John, that's fine. That's a, we translate also senior things. Okay, Grosjean is a, one of the leading names in bilingual research, and he estimated that 50% of the world's population are bilinguals. But I would say that this is a bit, you know, probably not exact number. Maybe there are more. There are much more because now we, you know, we travel. Uh, there is lots of immigration. Uh, we work abroad, so you know. There are more, maybe, than 50% of bilinguals. And according to uh, the European Commission, and they did a survey in 2012, but there is another one, it's more up to date, but more or less the results are the same. 54% uh, of people in the European Union, Union they uh, report themselves as fluent in at least two languages, so 54%. And uh, only... Uh, Sorry, and 25% actually they speak more than two languages. So they are multiple. Great Britain. Lazy country. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to speak English, so maybe uh, English people or British people in general, they don't feel the necessity to learn a second language. Still, impressive, 39% of British people, they report themselves as being bilingual. Not bad for a monolingual country. Right. But the problem is, who is bilingual? And uh, there is, again, Grosjean, who uh, came up with this nice definition. And this is the definition I always use in my research, because I think it's concise and gives uh, a real uh, flavor for who bilinguals are. So, people, of course, who speak at least two languages, but they need to speak these two languages in their everyday life. So, even monolingual speakers, they've been exposed to a second language at school. Maybe you study French or German, right? But you don't use it in everyday life. So, eventually, uh, as anything that you don't practice, it goes forgotten, right? Maybe you remember words like good morning, good afternoon but nothing really that would uh, allow you to establish a, a fluent conversation, right? Uh, Grosjean went a bit farther, just including dialects, because dialects can be proper languages. And uh, as an Italian person, uh, I can tell you that if I travel, you know, in Italy, and I'm from Tuscany, where the Italian language is, is, is the language, there is no dialect. There is kind of inflection, uh, a sound that can be a bit different, but we do speak Italian. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll 
disable my email in the moment. Um, so, uh, but if I travel to different parts of Italy, and I went to Sicily and Sardinia a uh, couple of, of years ago, and people there spoke their own dialect, I couldn't really understand anything that they said, because dialects can be different languages from, from the mainstream national language. But, again, another complication. There are more than one level of bilingualism. And we already saw that some of you are native bilinguals. So you learn two or more languages since birth. Okay? Then there are early bilinguals. Uh, these are people who started to learn the first language. Then uh, early in life, for many reasons, maybe the parents, they had to move from one country to another, they started to learn a second language within, let's say, five years of life. And these are described as early bilinguals. Then there are late bilinguals, like me, uh, people who completed uh, the first language, and then they started to learn a second one later in life, let's say, in, uh, when they were 12, 13, in secondary school, basically. Uh, there are lots of difference here, differences. They're all bilinguals, but clearly they differ in the way they speak, they sound, they have proficiency in their own languages. And just to give you an example, this is my lovely son, Joshua. And he was raised as a... Hello. <coughs> nice to see you. He was raised in the... In, in, in a bilingual environment, my wife is English, <coughs> uh, she speaks Italian. The dynamic in my house is a bit weird because we have, you know, weird conversation 50-50. Uh, I argue usually in Italian, my wife uh, answers to me uh, arguing in English. And so uh, it's okay, I understand. When I don't want to understand, I just... Yeah. I just still record it. <laughs> I should uh, warn my wife. <laughs> <laughs> right, so this is my lovely Joshua when he was five. So before he went to school, I asked him a question, and you're going to hear uh, the way he sounds in Italian and in English. The question is, what type of car do you like? I like the Ferrari. <laughs> And maybe catching the Ferrari. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he wants me to buy the Ferrari. But <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Anyway, if you appreciate, uh, I take this sentence because Ferrari is a kind of difficult word for oh. English people because the R is not like we do in Italian. Right? If you ask your English friends to do it, it, it's going to be funny, right? But he, when he spoke English, without me telling anything, he, he said Ferrari, with the English R, and he switched to the Italian with the double R. So that's the main difference between the native bilinguals and the late bilinguals like me. Well, they sound as a native speaker of both languages, whereas in the case of a late bilingual, this is not always possible. And it depends on the talent, of course, of the person. I'm not really talented because my Italian is still here. And, you know, some English sounds are a bit impossible for me. <laughs> and probably for many of you. Right, so language proficiency is another dimension. There are lots of different types of bilinguals here. You know two languages, but are you balanced, equally balanced in both? Maybe not, because the language you speak the most at school, for example, becomes more dominant. So you know more words in that language than the other. Uh, so the problem of dominance is, you know, quite important here. And there are also cases, especially in children uh, raising bilingual families, that they don't like to speak two languages because they don't feel confident. So they understand both, but they produce only one. And these are called receptive bilinguals. 
they are still bilinguals, but as you can see, this line of research for us uh, is not very easy because when you compare the performance of bilinguals, you need to take into account that there are many types of bilinguals. Okay? So you don't want to compare uh, pairs with apples, you need to compare homogeneous groups, otherwise your statistics is not meaningful. If you have any questions, please interrupt me anytime. So, uh, question here uh, is if learning two or more languages is good on, or bad? What do you think? Is it good or bad? Both. Bad. Both. Ah, both. But in general, I'm not talking about the brain. Yeah. Is it good to be bilingual? Yes. Yeah. yeah, of course. You must be proud of being bilingual. Why? Why do you think it's good? Communication. Okay. When we try, we know that this is a little dog, right? Okay. So imagine in your brain, you have the concept of this little dog. If you are bilingual, you have two representations of the word dog. And here the example of an English-Italian bilingual, in English would be dog, and in Italian would be cane, which is also a complication because in English cane has a meaning, right? Yeah. But in Italian we pronounce cane, not cane. So for this guy, there is competition, right? So which language do I need to use? Which one do I need to suppress? Uh, words are, you know, all here, they are popping up into, in, in my mind, uh, which one should I select? Then again, there is a competition of a similar word in English, so how do I know that cane is this one, or cane, it's another, you know, concept, another representation of the same word? It's not easy, and our brain has to resolve this competition in milliseconds, right? So, we need a traffic light. A traffic light that would say red to the language that we don't want to speak, or and green to the language that we want to speak. Okay? And this is executive control. <coughs> the traffic light in our brain, the switch in our brain, that controls this kind of competition. But the hypothesis, therefore, is trying to propose that for bilingual speakers, that they always, in their own life, uh, they have to suppress one language over the other. They always have to switch between two languages or more languages that they speak. Uh, they need to inhibit the for interference, the competition from one language and activate the others. And this is a, you know, a workout for the brain that we do every day. And this cognitive training, I would say all the training, would enhance executive, executive control, which is not strictly related <laughs> to language, but could be also for non-verbal processing, right? <coughs> it could be anything. So the bilingual advantage is not just a language type of advantage, but something that can extend to non-verbal domains. And we will see later what, what I mean. How do we measure executive function? So you know I'm a cognitive psychologist, therefore we do experimental uh, psychology, we, we test people uh, with computers, with neuroimaging, with lots of different methods, but at the end of the day we want to measure their performance and we need to make sure that the tests that we are using are actually measuring what we want to measure, otherwise it would be a bit of a problem. And uh, cognitive psychology offers a, a lot of classical tasks. If you are, uh, if you study psychology, you will come across all these kinds of tasks, not only for bilingual research, but for any research targeting 
uh, memory, attention, uh, metacognition, whatever you want to test in domains that are not related to language whatsoever. So, psycholinguists, you uh, studying bilingualism, they borrowed these tasks and readapted them into the, the area of bilingualism. One of the tasks that has been widely and internationally used is the Simon task, which I'm going to show you. It's a very easy, clever task. Uh, the instructions that we give to the participants are really simple. Computer screen, two buttons, is whatsoever on auditory attention. Everything was on visual attention. So I started to say, well, what if I design a kind of task <coughs> that, of course, I'm doing it in a laboratory, but I'll try to do it uh, ecological, right? So imagine yourself, you are in the street, or you are trying to read a book on the bus, and there are lots of people talking, maybe you're talking different languages, and your attention is always distracted by this noise around you, which is verbal <coughs> noise, but can be also non-verbal. But I focus on verbal kind of noise. So, it's an attentional task, basically, in which I wanted to see if bilingual were better to control interference, sound interference, than monolingual. Okay? And also, where in the brain uh, there is the relevant region involved in the control of interference. <coughs> Because at the end of the day, everything that we do, uh, well, it starts from here, right? And uh, I've got three publications here. One is a study with adults, one is a study with children, and one is a neuroimaging study. Now, briefly, I'm going to... Uh, well, first, uh, well, I'll give you a summary of my research. Uh, the second area is working memory. Working memory is related to the concept of executive function, right? So, uh, there is another study, again, designed in a way that could be ecological, in which I wanted to uh, investigate working memory in bilinguals and monolinguals. And in the last uh, area, metacognition, Again, there was a comparison between monolinguals and bilinguals adults in metacognition. We will see, I don't know if you are familiar with the concept of metacognition, but don't worry because there will be an explanation later. So, let's focus uh, uh, on this. Uh, okay, this is to say that all my studies <coughs> include language uh, uh, questionnaire, so we try to get all the information, as much information as we can about our participants. We don't want confounds, we don't want uh, you know, socioeconomic status uh, uh, kind of differences. Uh, we control for non-verbal abilities, for <coughs> intelligence, uh, memory. So we try to be as rigorous as possible. Clearly there is no perfect study, this is something that we have to say, but at least we try to control for everything that we possibly control. We can possibly control. Okay, now let's focus on the control of interference, which is the first area of my research. And the paradigm that I use, the experiment that I use, are called speech in speech paradigms. In this paradigm, I use uh, canonical sentences. And canonical sentences, they have a low comprehension demand. So we don't make an effort to understand these kind of sentences. This is an example. The cow is pushing the frog. This is a classical subject verb of the sentence, active. We read newspapers, books, and 80% of the sentences are constructed in this way. So no problem with that. Then I also use non-canonical sentences, for example, passives, like the frog is pushed by the cow. Here you can see, this is highlighted, the subject of the sentence is here, is in the second position, right? 
whereas here is in the first. So, and this would make your comprehension easy or more difficult. Okay, so if I ask you, what is the subject of this sentence? Of course, you would say the cow, but you need to think a bit more, right? Whereas here is more automatic. And the procedure uh, that I used in my first study was to test 20 uh, Italian English bilinguals and 20 uh, Italian monolinguals and English monolinguals as well. The participants, they had to identify the animal doing the bat action. So in the example that you saw before, the frog is pushing the cow, is the frog that is doing the bat action. Uh, the sentences, uh, you say, well, you talk about ecological, but how can the sentences be ecological? They are not, they're called pseudo-sentences, but we wanted to avoid any uh, factor like, you know, the experience that could reconstruct the meaning of the sentence. So, I haven't, I've never seen a frog pushing a cow, so if I ask you uh, who is the subject, you really need to think who is the subject. Whereas if I, if I say, I don't know, the cow is pushing the bull, probably there's something that you can, you know, understand without thinking too much. And the conditions were quite uh, challenging because uh, participants had to, for example, to process the <coughs> task in Italian, but simultaneously they also had to filter out interference that was, for example, in Italian and in English, counterbalance. So the task was quite easy without interference, of course, because there was a control kind of uh, condition, but was quite challenging when there was interference. And I'm going to give you an example of this. So uh, there was a visual input on a computer, the two animals, one on the left, one on the right, the buttons, and here, participant hearing two sentences. One is the target, in Italian in this case, and one was the interference. How could they screen out? The target was always spoken by the opposite gender. So the instruction was focus on the man's voice. The man saying this sentence, the woman saying this other sentence. And participants had to screen out the woman's voice. And this is the example. The frog was hit by the cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to listen to it again? Yeah. The frog was hit by the cow. Uh, right. And this is only one trial. There were 192. <laughs> All different, of course. And uh, at the end of the experiment, the participants. <laughs> it's not true. They were all happy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, what happened? What happened when we analyzed the results? And I'm going to show you the key results, right? So, here, no interference. Uh, blue are bilinguals. Red are... Sorry, can you see it? But, oh, I can use the laser. Fuck. Uh, that's technology. <laughs> Right, so no interference, English interference, Italian interference, and the task was done in this case in Italian because was the comparison between the Italian English bilinguals and the Italian monolinguals. <coughs> Look, canonical sentences, easy sentences, no difference whatsoever. This is correct responses, so the number of sentences uh, they were correct. Okay, but. The problem, uh, the problem, and the significant results, the highly significant results, were here, where the sentences were more difficult, the non-canonical one, and where the bilinguals, if you see, quite strikingly, they perform really well. So basically, they screen out interference almost perfectly, whereas the monolinguals, ooh, they had a little problem here especially when the interference was in Italian. And obviously so, because I Italian interference on Italian target language, it would complicate your life, right? Because uh, you have 
both languages, both, uh, one language that you understand, and two sentences simultaneously. Whereas maybe they were a bit more efficient, but not as efficient as the bilingual, when they had to process sound that they didn't really understand. So English. So we publish, and uh, also analyzing the data more in detail, and this is just the result of the bilingual group, we saw <coughs> that the more proficient bilingual tested with a standardized test of proficiency were actually uh, better in performing this kind of task. So proficiency was a reliable predictor of, uh, of best performance. Okay, do you have any questions here? Are you still awake? Yeah, give <laughs> me a sign. So, bilinguals, adults here, they seem to be more resilient to verbal interference, uh, especially when the, the, they had to perform <laughs> difficult sentences, not the easy one. The easy one were the same. So when the game gets harder, bilinguals seem to be performing better. And proficiency in English, of course, made a significant difference here. Yeah. So it's quite important to cognitive control. Now, uh, we took 26 adults from this study, and we put them into a scanner. You know we have a scanner at UCM. Did you know that? OK. Well, actually, if you want to take part in my study, this is marketing. Uh, and you want to see your brain uh, in action, uh, I can scan your brain for my study. So <coughs> send me an email. Uh, I'll scan your brain. <laughs> right. Uh, so what we did was to put these people into the scanner and uh, run an, an analysis. So it is called, uh, now I'm going to say funny name. Don't worry. It's just, you know, BBM. Uh, voxel-based morphometry. Basically, we subdivide the brain, the outside layer of the brain, the gray matter, in small cubes, okay? Small cubes, all associated with the region, so the, the, the areas of the brain. Uh, we analyze <coughs> all these areas of the brain, and we compare uh, with uh, uh, the task that we did, okay? The sentence interpretation task in knowledge. So it's a correlation. We put in correlation the brain with the task. And this is called voxel-based morphometry. I don't do it, I just press enter on a computer and everything is done automatically. So don't worry. It's not, I'm not a genius. It's just, you know, just software. This kind of analysis is very nice because you can see if structures of the brain can change according to specific cognitive functions. Okay? And you can analyze the whole brain, but it would be this analysis would be rather mean, meaningless if you don't compare <coughs> it with functional MRI. Functional MRIs are a different story. So you have people in the scanner actually performing the task, and you can see what happens in the brain in real time. Okay? Here, we just took the images of the brain, and we did some correlations with the task. Okay? Right. <coughs> what we found, to our surprise, I have to say, when we analyzed the whole brain of these 26 participants, we found Greater gray matter density, so greater, you know, uh, neurons in a specific part of not of the brain, of the cerebellum, which is a, another region of the brain, which, is, which sits more or less here, and is mostly involved in motor function. The cerebellum is really kind of computer that uh, deals with movement, but there are also parts of the cerebellum involved in cognitive control. And we were the first to find it, to be honest. Uh, so, and I'm going to show you the pictures here. So this is the cerebellum, and this is the area of the cerebellum in which we found difference in gray matter density. 
We were lucky because the, there was also another study by Crinion, a previous study, that showed the same activation, the same activity, but this is a functional study, right, of the same area in this part of the cerebellum. They didn't publish this result, so these results were reanalyzed in 2011 when we actually uh, try to make sense of our data. Uh, I, I was lucky because uh, I, in UCL, I mean, these people are from UCL, so I had contact with them, and when they saw my result, they said, ooh, hmm, hold on a moment. We might have results that we haven't analyzed. Let's do it now, and we'll see. And when they did it, we found the correspondence between stru structural MRI and functional MRI. So now we can say quite reliably that the cerebellum <coughs> is involved in the control of verbal interference. And nobody knew it. Obviously, if something happens here in terms of damage or stroke or any, an accident, we know that this area is involved in the control of but this generated new questions. So, uh, we tested adults. What about children? What about early bilinguals? Uh, well, this could be interesting because if you think what happens in a classroom with children is all about interference. It's all about shouting, right? <laughs> and they need to learn in such a noisy environment. So why we decided, that, I mean, why don't we ex extend the study to children? And this is what we did. So, we went to Cambridge, and in a primary school, very noisy. I spent, uh, I don't know, a couple of months there testing children. My head was spinning, so respect for the teachers in the primary school. They have all my unconditional respect for their work. And uh, we tested seven to 10 years old children, with more or less the same task. But this time, Clearly, the children were uh, coming from different countries, okay? So we couldn't test them in Italian or in English. Actually, we tested all in English because the second language was any. They, they were coming from nine different countries, European or Asian countries. So we decided to change the task. All the target sentences were in English. The interference could be in English. Everybody knew English because they were at school. Or Greek. Greek was the language that nobody spoke, okay? So there were no Greek children in our family. This is what happened. Canonical sentences, no differences whatsoever. They confirmed the adult results. But with canonical sentences, non-canonical sentences, look what happened. The bilinguals were really almost, you know, not perfect, but very efficient in processing when the interference was in Greek. But they were not really uh, efficient when the interference was in English. And English is the language that they knew because they uh, studied it in English, of course, at school. So with the language they didn't know, they completely filtered this out, but not the monolinguals when the language of interference was in English, they were like the monolinguals. So, this result was somewhat different from the others, if you remember, right? So, and this is a comparison between the children and the adults. <coughs> the adults were good, were performing good in both conditions of interference. Whereas children, they, on, uh, they, they perform only in one, the language that they didn't know. We refined the analysis and we uh, saw that through development, so from seven years old to 10 years old, as you can see, the bilingual, the monolinguals, they do not improve through development in the control of interference, whereas the bilingual, they start like the monolingual at seven years old, 
but they improve quite significantly through development. So, if this is true with, it, with such a, a small study, this, this will give us an indication of what happened through development. Okay, so you start like a monolingual, but then through development you acquire more cognitive control and therefore you develop cognitive control in a different way from monolingual speakers. Encouraging, again, small study, it requires more, more research. Now, I don't know how much time I've got. The, the room is until six. I can go on forever. And we <laughs> yeah. Is your tape uh, long? I mean, it's okay, I think. Huh? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, if you want, I can go on for another 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and then I leave you uh, half an hour for questions. Okay? okay? So, yeah, shall we do that? Are you alright? Okay, so, children, adults, bilingual advantage in cognitive control, auditory attention, it seems so. Uh, oh. More research is required, especially in understanding the role of the cerebellum here, which is kind of intriguing, and there is no research whatsoever on that side, apart from others. Now, working memory. Working memory, and this is a nice model from a guy called Bartley, uh, for people who study psychology. This is quite, I think, famous. Uh, he uh, developed, designed this model of working memory. As you can see here, there are three main components. One is visual spatial working memory. So it's the memory that we use for visual information. Here is the phonological loop, is the memory that we use for verbal information. And in the middle, the central executive uh, is the engine that will select our attention, that will process all this information, that will put together visual and verbal information. This, this is kind of concept of executive function, if you, if you see the, the link, right? Studies... Uh, <laughs> in the past show that there is no particular difference between monolinguals and bilinguals <laughs> in these domains, visual, spatial, verbal, working memory. But, you know, there was not really, this research was not really developed, so only a few studies attempted to investigate. So we decided to do a study uh, involving 30 uh, adult bilinguals, various cultural backgrounds, so various linguistic backgrounds, and 30 English monolinguals. Quite young. <coughs> the task was called the Change Blindness Task, or Spot the Difference. We played this game, I think, we all have played this game, in which we see two pictures. Uh, they look the same, but there is one item that change in the second picture, so we need to identi identify which one. And they also did a word span, a verbal working memory task. So visual working memory, change blindness, <coughs> verbal working memory, the word span. Now, this is an example of the change blindness <coughs> task. Can you see it? No. All right. So now I uh, change the image and you need to spot the difference. Yeah? What is it? Chivini. Who was the first? You, right? It took you one second because you're bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the results. <coughs> uh, we had a few trials. And it's quite, I mean, people quite uh, enjoy doing this test. Also children, I have to say, now we are doing it with children and they enjoy doing it because it's kind of game, right? But look at this, the result in the change blindness task. Uh, bilinguals were 11% uh, more accurate and three seconds faster exactly. than monolingual to spot the difference. And again, this may confirm that the bilingual advantage is for nonverbal uh, information, right? 
like pictures. So, so in in the in the domain of visual uh, visual working memory. Also because we couldn't find any difference in the word span. So monolinguals and bilinguals were identical in the uh, verbal working memory task. So again, so far so good. We found bilingual advantage in the auditory domain, the visual spatial, spatial domain. Uh, let's see uh, if we can continue logically in our investigation to metacognition. And metacognition is something that we do again in everyday life. Uh, is the ability to acknowledge and regulate our own performance. So I do something and then I ask myself, do I do it well or not? How many times we do it every day, right? This is very, very important cognitive domain. And when I saw uh, the literature available on metacognitive processing, I also saw that this is linked to executive function. So if you are more able to inhibit relevant information, to process information more efficiently, well, you have also an advantage in metacognition. You can decide, you can have a taste of your performance, if you did well or if you didn't do well. Right? So our question is, if there is a bilingual advantage in executive function, there should be there will be also an advantage in metacognition. So bilinguals will be better in making decisions. You wish that. <laughs> <laughs> and the way we tested in collaboration with Cambridge University it was with this kind of task, uh, in which, first of all, participants, they have to perform a very simple decision-making task. And this is called first-order performance. Then they need to <coughs> rate the level of confidence. So how confident are you? How do you rate your performance, right? And this is the second order performance. Then, again, uh, we click on a computer, enter, and there is a, a nice algorithm that processes all this nice information that we collect, and eventually it would give us a, a number, which is called the M ratio, <coughs> is a mathematical exercise here. And the M ratio is the index of uh, efficiency in metacognitive processing between the real decision making part and your understanding of what you've done. Okay? The study per se is very simple. It's the analysis that is a bit complicated, but the study is simple. So you have this task uh, in which participants they need to uh, say uh, which one of the two circles uh, contains more dots. <coughs> then they need to rate the level of confidence by shifting this arrow towards more or less. Okay? In the first study in which we tested a reasonable amount of people, again 60 people, half of them by bilingual, uh, here we didn't cut the response time. So they were free to decide whenever they wanted, okay? And what we saw was that bilinguals were much faster. So they start at the same level, and then throughout the task, their performance is really fast compared to, to monolinguals. Fine. This confirms the, the simul task, in which bilinguals, they are always more you know, dynamic. But when we analyze the M ratio with a computational <coughs> analysis, we saw that actually the monolinguals were much, much better than the bilinguals in rating their own performance. So basically, when they were wrong, they said, hmm, I feel I'm wrong. And when they were right, they said, oh, I feel I'm right. Whereas bilinguals were overall a bit over-optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay. So we tried to publish this, uh, and the editor said, wow, that's a very nice study, uh, but you just did one experiment. Uh, I would like to see another one. Uh, and this time, I don't want to see this. 
I don't want to see the bilinguals doing fast. I want to see the same amount of time. And it makes sense, because maybe it's because they were too fast. They, mi they kind of missed out uh, the, uh, the how to rate their own performance. Huh? So we follow this advice that was actually very good advice, and we run study two. Here, the same design, but this one was cut. So they had to respond to make a decision within 1.5 seconds, right? Otherwise, they were told off by the software saying, yeah, too slow, come on. <laughs> <laughs> right. And as you can see here, now we don't have a significant difference in reaction time, but still, monolinguals were better in metacognitive processing. Now, I know what they're going to ask me. Why? And I know what I'm going to reply to you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but obviously, bilinguals and monolinguals in this particular metacognitive process, they operate differently, that's for sure. And I'm not sure that metacognition can now be linked to executive function. I was sure at the beginning, now I'm a bit confused, right? And obviously, it, there are, these are two studies, and we had two different groups. We had the same results in two different groups. In total, we tested 120 people, which is quite large in, in cognitive psychology, in which we can rely on statistical power, statistical tools. So I think it's kind, it's very solid study. But uh, again, it's a sample of bilinguals, young adults, late bilinguals. What about children? What about uh, native speakers? Uh, uh, what about older population? Are they all the same? We don't know, right? So, but this study, this study, the only one, shows this kind of result, which is counterintuitive, and we didn't expect that. That's why now, and this is my current involvement in bilingual research, we finally got a research grant, which is uh, you know, nice to have, because now we can uh, run a large-scale study in which we investigate the effect of multilingualism across the lifespan. So not just focusing on one age group, one linguistic group, we do something that finally can be large. So we test bilinguals, multilinguals, we have executive function, metacognition, memory, control of interference. We put <coughs> together visual, auditory, uh, attention, verbal and nonverbal, and we can also run MRI. That's why I told you I can scan your brain, <laughs> right? So if we find something here, we will be able to check structural differences between monolinguals and bilinguals across the lifespan from seven years old to 80 years old. And we are going to test more than 500 people. Actually, we already tested 400, so there is another couple of years to go. Now, general conclusions, and uh, I'm really finished. So, there is evidence that bilingualism may, you know, provide an advantage in cognitive kind of functioning. But, you see, in science, uh, when there is someone that is providing counter evidence and providing good counter evidence, so with good rigorous research, we need to take this into consideration. Okay, we can't just dismiss these because maybe they are not expert. They just, you know, they just don't want to be part of the mainstream uh, uh, kind of uh, authors saying that there is an advantage. No, uh, I mean they are colleagues, and we need to uh, investigate more in order to find uh, if there is a, a real advantage or not. Uh, and obviously, the new findings are highly relevant for education because if, even, even if it's true 
that bilingual is meant to protect the brain from the effect of aging. Well, we would like at least to see uh, bilingual education more intense because eventually it will also provide a plan for this later in right? So this has political implications, educational implications. It's important. But we need precise answers. And the answers at the moment uh, are not clear cut. So, I hope to see you soon with new data from this large investigation, and you can also provide data if you want to take part in the study. One single word for my collaborators, without them I wouldn't be here, and especially with my guinea pigs, the bilingual monsters. Right, okay, well thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready for your question. We have to come Wow. <coughs> yes. Um, my question is about, um, um, sorry, um, about <coughs> accents. Um, accents. I've been waiting 30 years to ask this question. So um, I'm bilingual, half Italian, half English. And I have a sister, and there's only two year difference between the two of us, and we've both been exposed to about the same um, upbringing, Italian schools, um, uh, exposure to three or four months in the UK. Um, in, in the house, uh, up until the age of 10, it was two languages, then yeah. um, uh, my father deceased, so it was the English, English part it, more it, dominant. More dominant today. in the house, but Italian outside. But there is a difference between our accents. For some reason, I have no control over my either my Italian accent. I sound English when I speak in Italian, and a little bit of Italian in the English. And my sister instead is two years different. So only is her accent is completely English and completely Italian. The only thing I've noticed is in a third language, I seem to be in the accent way to be more proficient. For example, I, I have been told my German is, the accent is more Germanic. So I really want to know what is the well, impact on the accent. Right, okay, I wish I had the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing to say is that there are individual differences. Uh, I've got a friend of mine uh, who started to learn English at the same age as mine, my age. Uh, we uh, came into this country uh, at the same age, uh, but his English is perfect and my English is not. So clearly there is a problem with me. <laughs> but it's a talent, right? the personal talent. But uh, if you learn two languages since birth, Yes, right? Exactly, okay. At exactly the same at the same pace, and in, the, in, same the, in the same environment. Exactly. But this is something that I see also with my children. But you see, uh, the uh, my older children uh, is kind of better in both languages. Maybe this is the same case as yours, right? Is, uh, your, are you the younger? I'm the older. You are the older. Exactly. exactly. And I because So I'm you should more. be better than your sister. <laughs> Well, uh, if we in my to case, my oldest son is better than my second son. I don't think there is a there is a, a formula here. Uh, I think is we, we are discussing about individual differences, about also the experiences that you do. Because this is not about comprehension; it's about sound. It's about sound. It's about sound. And Maybe and motor. Did you watch television in Italian more than your no, sister? It, it, there must be something. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you drink more cappuccino? <laughs> <laughs> and, and culturally, uh, and it's very strange because culturally, though, I am closer to the um, Italian side only because I rejected the, the, um, the English side when I was older. And she uh, actually. You rejected the English side? Yes. All right. But, that's uh, that's but, uh, more on the emotional so side. Could it be? But the difference is, I've been exposed, I mean, as a... The only difference that I can find is that I've been exposed to more international, uh, multi-language environment, uh, having also acquired set of other languages right. in the process. So, but what is strange is, for example, I'm learning now Arabic, my Arabic accent is Italian. 
<laughs> so uh, my French has Italian accent, uh, my uh, Arabic has got an Italian accent, but my German has got just a German accent. Just Look, I will keep your Italian accent because it's the most charming accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just odd. <coughs> it's not very scientific <coughs> answer, but I would like to study your brain. If you, if you yes, I don't mind. I want to convince yeah. my sister. Also, but she's Bring your sister as well. <laughs> All because the family. It's odd. It's just strange. And there's not a lot of there's a lot of studies about comprehension, but not of this um, of accent. Yes, yeah. yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I sorry. Uh, sorry. May I say something on this? Yeah, from oh, sorry. Hold, hold your question. Yes. Women yes. first. Ladies first. From experience. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. No, that will be discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from experience with very young children, I think uh, because our vocal cords are part of our body, uh, they develop as the rest of the body. And I have um, a students who, when they speak Greek, Greek, their accent is perfect Greek. When they speak English, their accent is perfect English. And I have students who speak three languages, even four, and they change the accent to the language they speak. And what my point is, maybe uh, the younger you are, no, the better... This is for sure, but in her case... They yeah, were, in her case, were, they maybe they are individual no, 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 no. If you learn a language uh, uh, early in life, of course, uh, it's, it it's better. But anything you do, even if you play golf, golf. early in life, uh, you become yes, play the piano. Yes, my point yeah. is maybe because our vocal cords are part no, of because our Because body. our brain is more, is more receptive, it's more plastic, yeah. and therefore you can, uh, you can absorb sounds, you can process sounds better than than uh, in other life. That's, that's for sure. So, yeah, the, the, question to, uh, the, the answer to your question is easier. Uh, early life is better than later in life. This doesn't mean that you don't become proficient when you uh, really can write, we can, but not uh, as proficient as in processing the sound. I mean, there are sounds in English that I don't understand. I can't reproduce it. Sorry, yeah. Oh, a fantastic uh, lecture. Actually, oh, thank I you. Came along interested. I think it's brilliant. So thank you very much for that. Well, I'm, I'm the head teacher of two primary schools. Yes. And also a postgraduate student in your department. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in speech and language acquisition of children like three to five years old, pre five. Yeah. And um, my teachers think that there's an issue. Most of our children are bilingual. They're they learning English, but they come from a non-English background. Yeah. And my teachers think that there's a, an acquisition problem because the parents aren't quite sure how they should be talking to their children. They sort of mm -hmm. partly do it in their own yes. language, partly in English. Sometimes their English isn't very good. And they think that, they, they think that these are difficulties with the children when they're trying to learn English you know, at, at a young age. So I wonder if you have uh, first idea on those, those days, too. Look, there are lots of uh, different ideas on how parents should raise their, their bilingual multilingual children. Uh, obviously, uh, all families are, uh, they have their own history and their, their own preferences. In, in terms of educators, so uh, professionals, what, what should, they, should we say to these parents? Uh, in my view, uh, Parents talking, for example, uh, Polish at home uh, and having their children going to school and being exposed to English, they should continue to speak Polish at home. And then, what is it? Ah, oh, right, okay. <laughs> this is, I think, is the best result. First of all, because we know that two languages they don't confuse children. Okay. Then you uh, continue to link your cultural uh, approach, your, your, your culture in general, to the country in which maybe they have extended family, uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, and the children, they can still communicate with the extended family. <coughs> and uh, in terms of uh, academic achievements at school, a three-year-old, five-year-old child that speaks Polish at home, or Italian, or whatever, will catch up with English within six months. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, scientific evidence of it, and also practical evidence. I've got lots of cases of people 
coming here in this country, they don't speak English at all in the family, yeah. they have small children, they don't know what to yeah. do, they speak to the uh, teachers, teachers are worried of course because they say, oh my god, they are not exposed to English at home. Okay, but they are exposed to English at school for from 9 o'clock to 3.30, which is most of their day, right? And after six months, English kicks in and they speak perfect English, maintaining their native language and their cultural identity. That's fantastic. Yes. Sorry. Here and there. Yeah. I run a language school, a supplementary school. Yeah. And uh, what happened is quite the opposite after a while. What happened is if they come, if they move in from that home country here and then start speaking English, that the opposite happens. Then they only want to speak English and then they, they refuse to speak their parents' language. So what I think the schools should do is actually give an incentive to those children to carry on speaking their parents' language because they, in time, they start to refuse because they don't think they fit in if they speak a second language. And that can cause so many confusion to the children. Absolutely. And the parents are panicking because they think, oh my goodness, what shall I do now? Shall I force them to carry on talking my language or shall I give up? And most parents end up giving up and then they're fighting and, with my parents saying, up. don't give up. And there are other cases in which, uh, and there are still, you know, uh, actual uh, of educators, teachers, discouraging <coughs> the parents. Exactly. Yeah. That's my point. They discourage really, I, they, we have cases so of sad. teachers saying, oh, yes. they, they, they are uh, at, the, at the level of the research of the, you know, early the 90s. Right. Uh, no, there is no scientific evidence that uh, uh, there is any delay in uh, acquiring language between bilinguals and monolinguals. The same milestones apply for bilinguals and monolinguals. Uh, even in case in which there are developmental disorders, so for uh, children with autism or you know, ADHD or any kind of disorder of human development, uh, uh, there is no evidence that raising those children uh, as bilinguals would uh, be would give them an extra burden. Okay, so it, it wouldn't have any impact on the, the language development, which is already impaired by the, the developmental disorders. But bilinguals is not negatively affecting this problem. So really. It, Obviously, families with uh, one parent speaking English and the other parent speaking another language are a little bit, you know, they have an advantage here because they can have more balanced uh, uh, exposure. But again, it's the same story. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. Really like interested. I've got a question about your. You're bilingual. Not all the languages. Yeah. Both yeah. 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 Ye
um, acquire language because my learners, female learners, tend to perform better than male learners from my experience. <laughs> I'm not sexist, and I have not done transgender or non-binaries, which is another difference altogether. And also the age of acquisition, does it make a difference? So I was brought up speaking French, and then when I was four, I was sent to North Africa, and I picked up Arabic, but I had never been exposed to it before. Whereas people like to have it from birth, is there a difference? And then, depending on the language that you acquire... I need to process <laughs> my, my brain You're stimulating like my brain, brain. So, <laughs> I want to take you home and grill you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, uh, are you still recording? <laughs> Okay. Shall we shall we uh, go step by step? Uh, so the level of confidence was the first one. Uh, let's start from the second one. <laughs> okay, that's easy. No. Okay. <laughs> Age of acquisition. Age of acquisition. Age of acquisition uh, is a term that is too general. Uh, I don't see any problem. Oh, exposure? Yes, exposure. Okay. This is what I prefer. Okay. For example, I started to. Uh, acquire English when I was uh, 12 yes. uh, at school, secondary school. My teacher was Italian, speaking a uh, terrible English. <laughs> so I would say, I would erase that period. <laughs> so I would skip to when I was 38 and uh, I came here to work. And that's my exposure, my everyday life. So my English uh, is what you see now, which is not fantastic, but I was 38 when I moved <coughs> in this country. Now I'm 55, so I've got 18 years of exposure, plus a wife that I didn't have before. <laughs> and that is a, <laughs> and that's a, is a, is a fantastic exposure to <laughs> my wife. <laughs> As an exposure. <laughs> exposure to English, of course. Yeah. yeah. And also yeah. about the relationship between languages. So, for me, uh, um, uh, learning uh, Spanish and Italian when I speak French was a lot easier than learning. Because Italian. there is less yeah. distance between the two languages. Yes. So they're very they're similar. Roman languages. Yes. So, does your study into the languages? We try to uh, mix as many as many languages as possible. Okay, so uh, if we stick to specific linguistic backgrounds, clearly we may have this kind of compound of language distance, but our sample uh, usually includes all sorts of languages, so we should avoid this kind of compound. We should have avoided in our design this kind of compound. The first question is the most difficult one, the confidence. Yeah. Can you repeat it, please? It's, a, it's around the metacognition and whether yes. I, I believe that in order to be a proficient uh, language speaker, you need to have a high level of confidence. Okay, so uh, I, I don't test personality, emotions, uh, so I'm a really confident in psychology. Okay. And uh, in my paradigm, there are no questionnaires in which I measure what could be an extroversion, introversion, can affect you know the level of yes. the form. But if you think that we tested 120 people, half of them were bilinguals and half of them were monolinguals, they were all students in psychology coming from wealthy countries. So I would say that we had uh, you know we counted balanced people who were more extrovert, less extrovert, introvert, more confident, less confident. So in a, in a, in a fairly in, in large sample, you have a good representation of, you know, of the world population, right? Yeah. Uh, but if your question is, did you measure individually if they were confident, stressed out, uh, uh, more emotional? No, we didn't. Uh, but what we are going to do now in the large-scale study was actually to manipulate the language of instruction. And this is the question that someone asked me at the beginning about language of instruction. Uh, and we have kind of intriguing results. But I can't really, well, I, don't, I didn't run any significant analysis, but it looks like, for example, if you instruct the people in their own native language, so let's say in Italian, 
the metacognitive processing is efficient, is good. So clearly, the language that you instruct people before they do the task, it activates some kind of language mode that eventually may affect the reasoning and the decision making. So if you process your decision making in your own language, and you feel more confident in your own language, of course, you kind of uh, preserve this metacognitive ability of judging your performance. Whereas if you process in your, in your second language, probably you lose it. Mm. And this could be an explanation, but we need to analyze the results. But there would be probably a nice extension of what we saw. So it's not just confidence, it's also the language in which you process <coughs> that it would be significant in, uh, in your metacognitive processing. Right? No more questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. So my question is also a bit technical, methodological. We've been talking about all those comparisons of bilingual yes. versus monolingual, but those two groups are clearly different. There's a reason why some people became bilingual and a reason why some people didn't. How do all those studies deal with endogenous differences? Like, how can we really know that the difference comes from the fact of being bilingual and not because bilingual people may be uh, systematically more confident? or maybe systematically exposed to more uh, interactions with different types of people or cultures? How do those studies deal with this, if they do? Yes. Uh, what we know about our sample is what we ask in the questionnaires. And the questionnaires uh, collect biographical information, uh, uh, linguistic experience, uh, socioeconomic status information, information about the parents, the, the level of education of the parents, we, can't, uh, we also ask about leisure activities now. Uh, we want also to include the, the diet of people, because diet affects executive function. If you eat well, you think well. I'm yeah. vegan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should, eat. we should eat together. <laughs> <laughs> Invite him for lunch. Yes, yeah, okay. Anyone. Are you still so. recording? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 oh, okay. cut so none so of these studies uh, exploits any exogenous source of variation. There's no case where, I don't know, a government changed some policy in education that induced more people to acquire uh, bilingual uh, knowledge? These studies are really Nothing. cognitive psychology, psycholinguistic, canonical studies. Uh, you are, you know, more interested in the social aspect probably. Well, I'm interested in identification yeah. of the source of this no. variation and not being something else because... Yeah. No, this is a, these are quantitative kind of studies in which we, you know, collect data from population. We try to control uh, as much as possible for the factors that may confound the data and socioeconomic status we saw that can be one of them, but we cannot do, we don't do any kind of qualitative investigation and actually uh, you're right I mean it would be it would be good to have both but you know time money <laughs> expertise mm -hmm. and what are we gonna find uh, everything we do is theoretically <coughs> driven so we have models of working memory executive function predictions this is what cognitive psychology is, and we want to see with empirical research if those predictions are uh, met or not. So that's what we do. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. She yeah. And you already asked the question, no, so what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> um, so for people that acquire uh, second language literacy, yes. for late couples, um, is there, um, are there languages that have more advantages than others in terms of acquisition of other languages? In terms of uh, sound, performance, yeah, exactly. proficiency? Or, yeah, in proficiency yeah. and sound. Yeah. Yes, there are. Uh, obviously, again, individual differences, your talent makes a difference. Your motivation mm. makes a difference, of course, if you have a, you know, a partner speaking Spanish and you speak French. Uh, 
you want to speak Spanish, right? So you are motivated to, to learn it. But uh, language distance is what we discussed before. It, it makes a difference. So for me, as an Italian, uh, learning Spanish would be yeah, but For would example, be okay. I'm Portuguese. Yes. And so when I, I can understand and speak Spanish and Italian, but Italians and Spanish don't seem to understand me, or... <laughs> <laughs> because Portuguese is a bit different from Spanish okay. and Italian. Yeah, but yeah. why Why am I more... Uh, I mean, I don't it should know. be... Uh, both, <laughs> Maybe should because both you both like Spanish, Spanish and Italian. <laughs> it works actually for most Portuguese people. We seem right. to be able Portuguese. to understand Spanish and Italian quite easily. So if I speak Italian now, you, yeah, you understand, I understand what I... Yeah, I will understand everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, it could be your talent, of course, or you, mm -hmm. uh, you process the sound. Uh, it depends who speaks Italian, who speaks Spanish, because we can speak yeah. quite fast, and the faster we speak, probably the more you lose in terms of comprehension. Uh, for me, learning Spanish or French, uh, and I did it in the past. Now I forgot everything because I don't practice, but it wasn't really difficult because they are very similar. And even though you don't remember a word, you just make it up, just doing the French sound or the Spanish sound. Portuguese is a bit more challenging. I, it's, it's, it's kind of different language. Even the sound is different. For me, I feel Portuguese would be more distant to, from Italian to learn. It would be Although more I feel very near to... I mean, I, the, the, yeah. the roots are the same. It's, it's Latin, it's, you know, but uh, the sound is a bit different. But I agree, I mean, they are all pretty similar. Uh, the fact that you understand Italian and, and, and Spanish and we don't understand Portuguese, well, it's bad for us <laughs> because we should. Portuguese is nice. Yeah. All right. I don't know if I answer sensibly this question. We have lots of different questions. I don't know how to. Who's moderating here? <laughs> Who raised the hand? Seven minutes left. Okay, quick question. Quick. Yeah. Uh, uh, we do this. I am yeah. more interested in language teaching. And yeah. apart from the families, what should the teachers do in the classroom? Using the target language and the first language at the same time, or only using the target language, which is much better <coughs> for learners to learn language? Well, in mainstream schools in England, they teach in English. Uh, actually, I come from China. I mean, uh, if I teach English in China, so right. But uh, okay, let me understand the uh, example because I just went to visit the school here, just there in Rambeau. It's a French English school. It's a private school, and they teach English and French, but not as a language subject. They have half a day teaching maths, geography, right, in English, and the afternoon they teach in French, but the subject. And the following day they swap. They start with French and they teach English in the afternoon. These are called bilingual schools. Huh? I don't know, but they're private. Okay. But, uh, you see, this is a really bilingual education because you learn maths in both languages and you build also the vocabulary in both languages and you are biliterate. You are not just bilingual. You can read and write in both languages. Whereas the majority of bilinguals, they just write in one. Of native bilinguals, of course. Because they don't have exposure of literacy in the second language. So, uh, but your question is about language teaching, yeah. right? So Especially you can answer, yeah. please, ah. so I can drink a glass of water. Yeah, no, <laughs> Professor Melanie Kurka has done some research very recently. She's from King's College University on Northern Lingualism in teaching English. And there's some evidence now that using um, the target language as well as English, because it used to be English only, please, and then all of the connotation around, you know, colonialism and all that kind of stuff. So the trend now in teaching English is um, controlled target language use. So for example, if it's to explain uh, grammar or instruction, if it's preventing the person from doing the task, 
then it's recommended that you can use just as a shortcut or using um, is it are you have do you have a monolingual class or multilingual class mono yeah can we sorry can we hold yeah. the long questions yeah. and just do a kind of sorry. shooting of press and answer because we have t three minutes yeah so uh, my friend when he grew up he had four languages at home so arabic english in French and Norwegian, and he said that he actually struggled to learn any of them. Is there any evidence that having too many languages in the house no. is... There is no evidence whatsoever <coughs> that <coughs> learning more than two, three, <coughs> four languages can be detrimental whatsoever. So okay. this is something that is related to your friend. <laughs> but in terms of oh, uh, quantitative, well. quantitative research doesn't show anything. There are individual differences, but I don't do individual differences or case studies, I do quantitative. Yeah? Um, so I'm wondering um, if you've ever done experiments with this um, or reached in the past. I found that if there are siblings whose parents only learned English coming here to work, for instance, and spoke, in my case, my friend's case, Portuguese, at home only. Um, I find that the older sibling speaks better Portuguese and equally better English than the second sibling. Um, is there any evidence that because the second sibling is younger and maybe by the time that they're learning to speak, the first sibling already speaks English, English mm -hmm. is kind of their first choice language? Because I've noticed that, for instance, in this case, like the Portuguese uh, level for the youngest sibling is a lot weaker than for the older siblings. Because they are raised more here. Mm -hmm. They're both raised here, both born here. But um, they are second, yeah. The yeah. second child usually is a bit weaker. This yeah. is what we see. I don't know if this is consistent to the scientific, to be honest. I've yeah. never seen uh, proper research uh, just saying that they're the first born. Uh, yeah. I give up to, on the second one. Yeah, I mean, the second one, maybe they are not so keen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, it depends. It depends on the city because they also interrupt, right? Yeah. My children, for example, they spoke Italian since they were five, yeah. both, but then they switch into English. At that point, uh, the older uh, son, he had a better Italian than the second one. They started oh, to, 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 to speak English all the time, yeah. and the second one was more fluent in English than Italian. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happened also in the interaction between the siblings. Mm -hmm. But this is again something that uh, uh, happens in many families, and I don't know if there are quantitative studies showing this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. There are there? I think it's something to do with emotional prosody and emotional processing. And emotional prosody and processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's something to do with how are you, how much are you attached to the language and the culture as well. Clearly, the emotional component is important, but uh, again, I, this is something that I've never studied, and uh, probably it would yeah. be nice to extend this line of research, including qualitative analysis, emotional component, and also case studies of interaction within the families. Yeah. Uh, this is usually what linguists do. Uh, I've got a colleague, uh, Annick de Huber, uh, she wrote a fantastic book that actually uh, is in our library, you can borrow it. Uh, Annick de Huber, H-O-U-W-E-R, uh, she works in Germany at the moment. Like I stole the vacuum cleaner, Annick de Huber. De Huber, yeah, Annick de Huber. What? <laughs> what? Um, we can't take the make of colleagues uh, why, why we are on YouTube because they're, they're going to gonna sue us. Please cut this, <laughs> edit it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, she did lots of case studies in, uh, in which she can show you the interaction within families uh, and the results uh, of language learning within different types of interactions. Uh, the most the striking cases are also re related to children of diplomats, that they move from country to country every two, two years, and children, of course, they need to replan, relearn all the languages, and there are nice stories in that book, also on the emotional component that uh, worthwhile reading. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. The last one. Is it the last one? <coughs> yes, it is the yes. last one. 
Uh, so sometimes when you read about um, bilingual studies, they also mention learning a music instrument. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's just like complementary in, in the effects they have on the brain or if learning a music instrument actually does function as another language. That's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. Okay, learning music really is important also uh, for the development of executive function. And there are studies showing that. Not bilingual studies, just you know, studies uh, with uh, uh, children, especially children learning music and, uh, and non learning uh, Bialystok and colleagues in Canada, they did lots of studies with uh, musicians and bilingualism, trying to show that learning languages can also be beneficial for learning music. And it looks like lots of musicians are also bilingual. Uh, the question is, are they uh, good at learning languages because they are good at processing sounds in music or uh, they learn music because they are proficient in processing languages. I don't know if there is a clear cut answer but there is definitely a correlation between uh, learning languages and also learning music. Yeah because rhythm stress intonation well, yeah. learn a new language, the first thing yeah. I did is just get a... But it could know. be the other way around, you see. It could no, be that, yeah. you know... It could be, the other way it could okay. be right? Yeah. Yeah. It could be that bilinguals can learn music, but also a good musician can learn language. Exactly. So, yeah. And we don't know the causal yeah. kind of relation. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's the rhythm. Maybe it's the rhythm. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, yeah. clearly it's sound processing. And there are people who are more talented, even in the accent. Uh, it, it I was going to mention about the accent. I yeah. think it's a lot to do the way you hear the sound. <coughs> so because people yeah, are very much judged as well by the accents. And it doesn't mean yeah. anything yeah. that you speak better or worse than anyone else. But yeah. well, people get judged by the accents. And it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, okay. thank you so much yeah. for casting yeah. the